talk about certifying polynomial non-negativity via hyperbolic optimization. Okay, thank you very much, Bern, for the introduction and, and for uh, the organizers for inviting me to be here. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's wonderful to see some people I know, but also many people I don't know, and I look forward to meeting you throughout the workshop this week. Okay. What's this talk about? So, uh, at some level, I'm interested in the basic problem of deciding whether a multivariate uh, polynomial with real coefficients is non-negative globally. Okay, so that's kind of the basic you know, underlying question in the back of our minds for this talk. And what's the, the main idea I want to sort of put forward in this talk is one approach um, for trying to come up with certificates of non-negativity of a multivariate polynomial but somehow I can search for them via hyperbolic optimization, by solving a hyperbolic optimization problem. Okay, so I want to sort of present a, a one approach to finding these kind of tractable certificates, sufficient conditions for non-negativity. Right, so that's, that's the main you know, thrust of the talk. There's going to be kind of three parts to the talk. The first part I'm going to say what are hyperbolic polynomials and hyperbolic optimization and so on to make sure you know, it's the first talk of the of the workshop, so I think it's a good opportunity to just say these things. Um, then I'm going to move towards how do I get somehow non-negative polynomials from hyperbolicity in, in you know, one natural way to do that. And then the last part, of the, the middle to end of the talk, will be about sort of understanding a bit about the relationship between these hyperbolic certificates of non-negativity and sums of squares, which is a kind of perhaps more familiar, more well-studied way of certifying non-negativity of multivariate polynomials in some kind of tractable way via convex optimization. Okay, so let's start with hyperbolic polynomials. So um, we'll say that a polynomial that's homogeneous of degree d in n variables, so I'll try to stick to the d for degree and n for number of variables, um, is hyperbolic with respect to some direction in Rn. <coughs> if, um, when I evaluate the polynomial in that direction, it's positive, negative is also okay, just not zero. Okay, let's say positive. That's one thing, and more importantly, perhaps, is that no matter where I start in my space, if I look at my polynomial along the line defined by this direction, okay, it has all real roots. Okay, so this is the basic definition. And okay, so here's an example of somebody who is hyperbolic with respect to, say, the, the vertical direction. If I start anywhere and I go on a, a line, I hit this surface where the polynomial vanishes exactly twice, counting multiplicity. Um, and this is an example of a situation where I'm not hyperbolic because if I hit this surface only twice, I only have two real roots uh, and two complex roots. Okay. And just a quick comment that although I'm not going to make a lot of use of this in the talk, um, in the definition here I'm saying this needs to happen for all x in the space. It's pretty easy to see that it's fine to restrict to some, for example, co-dimension one subspace that doesn't contain your distinguished direction. So many of the statements I'll have polynomials in n variables, you can potentially restrict them to be polynomials in n minus 1 variables by this kind of idea, and using this kind of idea, and things will still be true. Okay, so just want to put that out there. So these are hyperbolic polynomials. The reason from an optimization perspective, I think these are interesting, is that there's a natural convex object associated with a hyperbolic polynomial. And that is what we call a hyperbolicity cone. Okay. So I can define a cone all right, by taking all the points in Rn so that when I look at this characteristic polynomial type object, okay, I look at the roots along this line, I've changed the minus signs just for convenience here, um, that all of these real roots are non-negative. Okay. So my polynomials are defined to have real roots along this line. I can ask the, the points where all of these roots are non-negative. This defines a cone. And you know, the f a foundational result in this area is that this is a convex cone, closed convex cone, a uh, result that dates from the PDE literature in the 50s. Okay, so just to look at our one of our examples, if I take this particular polynomial, um, insisting that the roots are non-negative will give me this solid ice cream cone, or Lorentz cone, or second order cone, um, very familiar in optimization. John, you have a question? For, for the degree 4 counterexample, this cone is convex also, right? Uh, what's the meaning of this cone? I mean, as I defined it here, it's not the... counterexample where 
I mean, I can take this picture and I get the convex cone, but uh, I don't know what, uh, my definition does not probably make sense. So, yeah. Okay, so this is just to, you know, to have a fixed concrete example in mind. And so once I have a nice way to construct a convex cone, um, as, an as an optimizer, I think about then defining a class of optimization problems, a family of optimization problems, where I consider optimizing a linear cost function subject to some affine constraints and this conic constraint. Okay, so this defines a nice family of convex optimization problems. All right, that, okay, it looks kind of mundane when presented like this, but um, you know, there's lots of special cases of this problem uh, that turn out to be very interesting. Okay, linear programming is very interesting, where I take a particular choice of polynomial and where my hyperbolicity cone is a non-negative orthant. Second-order cone programming and, second and semi-definite programming come up with different examples of this hyperbol hyperbolic polynomial or hyperbolicity cone. Okay, and so I guess one thing that's very much not obvious that we've learned over the years, very much not obvious which optimization problems I can and cannot rewrite somehow in, in some equivalently in this form. But in the case of hyperbolic programming, sort of this class of problems is of particular interest because um, of this fact that if you take the negative log of this polynomial, okay, this gives me a nice barrier function on this code. Okay, there's a whole theory of interior point methods um, that then means that I can, from this, uh, essentially extract efficient algorithms to solve this class of optimization problems. And we're going to hear a bit more about the algorithmic side later today, I believe. Okay, so um, we'll see more about concrete algorithms for these class of problems. Or at least there's a little caveat. I'll get efficient algorithms if I can evaluate P. Okay, so it's, it depends on how this polynomial is presented to you. Um, it's <laughs> relatively easy to come up with hyperbolic polynomials that are not easy to actually evaluate. With some, num some degree and some number of variables that are reasonable, but it's quite difficult to evaluate them. So one needs to be a bit careful, and it also suggests this is, you know, quite a big problem class, perhaps, because you have these kinds of complicated examples. OK, so that's my quick intro to hyperbolic polynomials, this corresponding convex object, the hyperbolicity cone, and now this class of optimization problems, hyperbolic programs. All right, so let's now talk a little bit about testing for hyperbolicity. So um, you give me a uh, homogeneous polynomial in n variables of degree d, okay? You want to decide is it hyperbolic or not, okay, with respect to some direction. Okay. I'm going to come back to this a little later in the talk, this idea, but I'm also, it's going to lead into our way of producing you know, non-negative polynomials naturally from hyperbolic polynomials. So that's, that's kind of the motivation for discussing this. And so there's many different ways to test for hyperbolicity. hyperbolicity. One way, and the way I'm going to sort of, the thread I'm going to follow in this talk, is by looking at, uh, by taking my polynomial, and here I've got this lambda sub, L, lambda sub L of x, these are going to be the eigenvalues with respect to this polynomial, so the real roots of my hyperbolic polynomial on the, the E direction. Okay, and I can build this matrix of power sums. Essentially, it's Hankel matrix of power sums. Okay, the, the minus signs are not super important, but they're for convenience for what I'm doing. And you know, there's a result that I mean is in this paper of, of Tim Netzer, Daniel Plowman, and Andreas Plum, but you know, it's kind of classical result. I'm not, yeah, exactly. Uh, is that P is hyperbolic with respect to E if and only if this matrix is PST for all X. Okay, so this is a matrix with, it's not obvious from this description, but with polynomial entries. Okay, <coughs> the power sums I can relate to the coefficients of the polynomial. So this has polynomial entries. And so this matrix of polynomial entries, if it's PSD for all x, okay, then I'll be hyperbolic and converse. Okay, so already we see that if I, you know, if I know for some reason my polynomial is hyperbolic with respect to some direction, I get some non-negative polynomials. So for example, I could look at the diagonal entries here, or I could evaluate this, this quadratic form somewhere, and I'll get some non-negative polynomials. So I want to just 
and sort of the reason why this is true, if you haven't seen it before, is that this, in the case where you have, this is really the Vandermonde matrix times its transpose, or one way or the other, and if all the roots are real, that will be a nice you know, Cholesky factorization and give you a PSD. <coughs> so I want to just, you know, write down one way to, one way to produce this object, okay, um, that will generalize on the next slide and will give us more non-negative polynomials from our hyperbolic polynomial. Okay, so what's the alternative view? Or one view of this, I could think about a rational function. So I think of it, this is a univariate rational function in t, in my variable t. Okay. So where I take the derivative of my polynomial, so I'm using this notation d sub e for the directional derivative in the e direction, but this is really just the derivative of this polynomial in t. Divided by my polynomial, I write it out as a Lorentz series like this, and I look at the coefficients. And I build a Hankel matrix out of these coefficients, and I get exactly this Hankel matrix up here. Okay. So I just wanted to sort of present that, because what's going to happen on the next slide is we're going to do something like this in a tiny bit more generality. All right. So that was a nice kind of, gave us a way to connect hyper, being hyperbolic to kind of a certain polynomial matrix being PSD for all x. What we're going to now see as a kind of very similar type statement that describes the hyperbolicity code. Right, so what we're going to do is something very similar, at least to define this, this object. So I'm going to define a polynomial matrix. It's a Hankel matrix. So it's polynomial at x. It's going to be linear in this other variable u. And I'm going to sort of tell you how to define it up here from this rational expansion point. So what I'm going to do is take the derivative, the directional derivative of my polynomial, not in the e direction, but just in the direction u. Okay, and u can be whatever you like, your favorite u in Rn. Okay, I can take its derivative over this polynomial, think of it as a rational function in t. I can do the same kind of expansion and look at these coefficients. Okay, they're all going to be linear in u because this derivative is linear in u. Okay. And they're going to be some polynomials in x. And I can define a Hankel matrix out. And what turns out to be the case is that this, if I plug in a u that's in the hypervelocity cone, this thing will be PSD for all x. And conversely, um, if this thing is PSD for all x, then this u has to be in the hypervelocity cone. So this is, um, this is kind of the central construction that will produce for us somehow a family of non-negative polynomials um, where I can... Uh, that are exactly kind of described by the hyperbolicity co co corresponding to my hyperbolic polynomial. And I want to point out that I've presented this in a particular way here, just because it's relatively you know, self-contained to, to define things this way. There's a completely equivalent version of this story in terms of Bayesians, okay, where you think about interlacing, the fact that this polynomial interlaces this polynomial, if and only if u is in the hyperbolicity cone, which is a result that's in a paper of uh, Mario Kuma and, and Cynthia and Daniel. Um, and, so, and these are really equivalent in the sense that there's a, a polynomial congruence transformation that relates the Bezuschen of these things to this Hankel matrix. And so they're really kind of the same thing, just written in a different basis. Okay. And I want to say it's also these re results are very, very related um, to uh, results of, of, of Mario, Daniel, and Cynthia, where so I have a very similar characterization under a slight additional assumption on P, um, where you have U in the hyperbolicity cone if and only if um, the Ronskian of these two polynomials is non-negative, which is really one, the, one of the diagonal entries of the Bayesian. So these ideas are really all kind of the same thing. All right, so let's do an example, because that's all a bit abstract. So let's look at the determinant restricted to symmetric matrices. Okay, so, and the direction of hyperbolicity being the identity direction. Okay, so in this case, the eigenvalues, the hyperbolic eigenvalues are just the, the eigenvalues of this symmetric matrix. Okay, and if you, um, if you build this object, okay, 
you build this object where it turns out to be the ij entry of this Hankel matrix is my matrix to this power, okay, times by u, my direction, and then take the trace. Okay. So let's see, kind of you know, observe the, the, the result in this setting. So if u is PSD, so the hyperbolicity cone here is the positive semi-definite cone. So if u is in the hyperbolicity cone, then you can factor this thing. Okay? I can write the ij entry as this trace of you know, something times something, transpose, so I get a nice polynomial factorization of this matrix. So it's certainly PSD for all x's that I plug in. If u is not PSD, then it's not difficult, okay, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do it, to, to be able to explicitly construct a, a y to plug into this PSD matrix, okay, so that if you do y transpose, you evaluate at x equals u, then you have u in here, you get something, you get in fact the smallest eigenvalue of u, which is negative in this case. Okay, and this y is really the coefficients of a polynomial that interpolates the eigenvalues of u. That's one on the smallest eigenvalue of u and zero on all the other ones. Somehow that's really where this y comes from. Okay, so hopefully this maybe helps you believe this result in this concrete case. And in fact, once you prove this concrete case, you can in fact use it to prove the, the result. Okay, and I claim this via the helton binnikov theorem that I'll mention a bit later, but many people know this result. And the reason that's true is that if you fix u and you fix x and you fix identity, the statement is really only about u, x, and identity. This positivity statement here. Okay, the, all this construction, I think about fixed u, x, and identity, and, and e. That's all that matters, and so I can restrict to a three-dimensional slice and ask this question of when is this thing positive on the three-dimensional slice. So that's kind of one way to establish this result. Okay. All right, so what we've now seen, or one way to view what we've just done, is a way to um, construct a family of non-negative polynomials associated with a hyperbol hyperbolic polynomial and a direction of hyperbolicity. Okay, so two pieces of data we used to define. And I'm just going to use some notation so that we can forget about all this stuff and just think about this object that is, you know, some object that's a polynomial in x and y. So I'm just turning this into a scalar thing to make life better or simpler. Um, and it's linear in u. And it has the property that this thing is globally non-negative as a polynomial in x and y if and only if u is in the hyperbolicity curve. So we can also think about really what I'm doing is producing a, you know, a convex cone of non-negative polynomials. Okay. It's really linearly isomorphic to the hyperbolicity cone. So writing a copy of the hyperbolicity cone in, in non-negative polynomials. In fact, it's a section of the cone of non-negative polynomials. All right, so this is you know, a nice construction. Um, but what's kind of very convenient about this is that there's sort of no constraints here. These are globally non-negative polynomials. And so I can produce more non-negative polynomials by composing with polynomial maps first. And that might seem like a crazy thing to do, but it's really what we do with sum of squares. Right? We start with non-negative quadratic forms. We compose with some other you know, moment map or whatever, and we get a much bigger family of non-negative polynomials. So I claim that's the precedent for doing what I'm about to do next. Okay. And that is sort of to introduce this bigger machine to produce non-negative polynomials. Okay, so, what I'm, so now there's more data to specify, which is okay, maybe good, maybe not good. Okay, but I'm going to have, I'm going to need a hyperbolic polynomial with respect to some direction. I'm going to fix those two. I'm going to fix. So I'm going to think about producing polynomials in m variables now, some new space. I'm going to fix a map that goes from m to r n and another polynomial, polynomial map from Rm to Rd, so D is degree, N is number of variables, and I'm going to essentially just compose in my two slots with those maps. Okay. And again, these will all be non-negative polynomials if U is in the hypervelocity cone. Okay. And so I'm going to give these a name just for the, to have a name for the talk, and I'll say that if I can write my polynomial Q in this form, okay, for some fixed 
e, f, and g, so lots of data to specify, I'll say that q has a hyperbolic certificate of non-negativity. And again, this produces for me a nice convex set of non-negative polynomials. Okay? And this is now, this set of polynomials is now a projection of the hyperbolicity curve. It's a linear projection of the hyperbolicity cone because if you sort of were to look at the coefficients of this polynomial on some basis, they would all be linear functions of u. Okay, because this expression is still linear in u. Um, and so that would give me a linear projection of the hyperbolicity cone. Okay, so what's the other ni very nice thing is that if you give me a polynomial q and I go and specify the data for this thing, I can try to search for a description in this form by solving a hyperbolic programming problem. Okay, because these are, you know, if I have this constraint that Q equals this thing, okay. in terms of, uh, these, this is giving me affine constraints relating, say, the coefficients of Q to U. <coughs> this is in my form of sort of the intersection of the hyperbolicity cone with some affine constraints. Possibly a projection. Yes, David. So when you say you can search over these, so you're searching over which parameters? P is still fixed and you're searching over F and G? No, no, no. Or even P, no. F and G are P, E, F and G are fixed. They're all fixed. They're all fixed. You have to specify a lot of stuff before you start here, which is, okay, thank you. Okay, and, and the search is over U. What role do P, F and G play? Um, so I guess P and E define this family of polynomials here. F and G allow me, for example, to uh, change the degree, or possibly I might have a hyperbolic polynomial in, I might have this and may not have not many variables. I may want to use a hyperbolic polynomial with lots more variables and then restrict to a subspace using these F and Gs. So it's very, I mean, I don't understand very well what I can, you can do with these things. So what happens is that coefficients in U depend polynomially on the coefficients of F and G, right? So you, f and g should not know about u. But if I fix the u1, right? I look at the coefficient of u1. It's linear in u1. There's one coefficient. This will be a polynomial in the coefficients of f and g. Right? Oh, could you say one more time, Rainer? Yeah. So coefficients of, is linearly depends on u, right? Yep. And coefficients of the ui are polynomials in the coefficients of f and g. Yes. And they the linear relations among these give you the projection of the hyperbolicity complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So what kind of invariance properties does this have? I mean, is Q, for instance, a set of Qs? Can you make choices in such a way that this is invariant that they're O n? Uh, I guess on the next slide we'll see an example where you can. Yep. But um, yeah, I don't. I don't know in general what how to choose things that have good properties. Okay. So okay, maybe not the next slide, but the next next slide. So what I want to now move towards is trying to understand a bit about how these relate to sums of squares. Okay, I've given you a way to produce lots of non-negative polynomials. Um, if these polynomials are all sums of squares, it's probably not very interesting. So uh, let's at least see how these are related to sums of squares in a few different ways. Okay, so let me just remind you what sums of squares are. I've referred to them a few times, but perhaps not everybody's seen this. So, so if I've got a polynomial Q, and I can write it as a sum of squares of other polynomials, okay, then I'll call it a sum of squares. Okay, it's an easy definition. Um, and then, you know, evidently, my polynomial Q will be non-negative for all inputs. It will be globally non-negative, okay? Because squares are non-negative. So that's the sum of squares. Um, and we can search, you know, if you give me a polynomial Q of some degree 2D, even degree, I can search for a sum of squares description of Q by solving a semi-definite optimization problem. Okay, so how does that go? Well, what you do is you <coughs> build some big long vector consisting of all the monomials in these multiple variables z up to degree d. Okay. And then it turns out that you're a sum of squares if and only if 
there exists a positive semi-definite matrix Q here, big Q, so that this polynomial identity holds. So just like on the previous slide, I've got an expression on the right-hand side. It's linear in Q. Okay. Um, and if Q is in some nice convex cone, then I get non-negative objects. Um, and these are affine constraints relating the coefficients of Q, little Q and the entries of big Q. Similar kind of structure, but very much for semi-definite programming and, and the PSD code. So the first thing you're going to notice is that um, our hyperbolic certificates, if I choose the data, or these many things that I need to choose, if I choose them carefully, I can recapture sums of squares. That's a special case. Um, the choice is quite natural, except for a tiny little, you know, slightly weird thing that I need to do. Okay, so let's have a look at this now. Okay, so just reminding from the previous slide, so I'm going to start with, a, I'm going to think about, you know, all things that are, say, sums of squares of degree 2D. Okay, and I'm going to try to capture all that collection of things using the data from this hyperbolic certificates. Okay. So how do I choose things? Well, I'm going to choose P, my polynomial, to be determinant of the size, actually one larger than the size here. Choose e to be identity. Okay, so the cone, the hypervelocity cone I'm going to be working with will be a PSD cone. Okay, and now the other two pieces of data I need to specify are here some polynomial that, when p is determinant, should produce symmetric matrices, and some polynomial here that should produce uh, vectors to go on either side of the quadratic form. Okay, so what I'm going to do is choose. This polynomial f that produces symmetric matrices, okay, and so this this is a small zero, this is a very big zero, okay, so this is long here, that's long in that direction, this is a big zero here, and then I'm just going to take my other polynomial just to pull out one of the entries. Okay, it's very simple. Yeah. And the key thing is that if you take the square of this matrix, okay, if you take the square of this matrix, you get um, the moment vector times its transpose in this bottom big block. So that's the fact that's making this construction work. And so if you really plug in these choices, what ends up happening, um, and this pulls out the, the second diagonal entry of my uh, ankle matrix, which is really just the trace of this slot squared times this matrix. Okay, so I've got the trace of this slot squared times this matrix, which produces for me my sum of squares. So I'm not expecting you to sort of see the details of why that works. I'm just trying to sort of say that, you know, I can capture exactly, I mean, really I would solve the same semi-definite programming problem um, either way. So somehow, if you, if you choose these data correctly, um, you will get that family, and that is a family of certificates that's nicely orthogonally invariant and so on. So of course, so it's nice that we can capture sums of squares, but again, we would like to do more than get sums of squares out of this construction. Okay. Um, and so I'm just going to introduce a definition for some shorthand. So I'm going to say that a polynomial P is SOS hyperbolic with respect to a direction. Okay. If <coughs> all of the polynomials I get this way, when this parameter U is in the hyperbolicity cone, are actually sums of squares. We know they should be non-negative, but if they're always sums of squares, let's call it SOS hyperbolic. Okay, and the question I want to ask is, for which uh, numbers of variables in degrees d, okay, um, are there hyperbolic polynomials that are not sums of squares? So this is not uh, so hyperbolic polynomials that are not SOS hyperbolic. So where my construction gives me new certificates of non-negativity that are not captured by sums of squares. Um, Okay. So that's the question I'm going to be interested in. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Does this definition depend, like, does this property depend on E? Um, I don't know if this property depends on E. Okay. The whole construction does depend on E. Um, and so that's a, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. So let's start with some bad news. Okay. But 
depending on your viewpoint, is good news. But my, for my viewpoint today, it's bad news. And that is that there are some situations where all the things, all the non-negative polynomials you produce this way will be sums of squares. <coughs> and so one uh, sufficient condition for this to happen is that if a power of p has a definite determinant or representation, okay, then p is S of S hyperbolic. Okay. And what is definite de determinant or representation? It's a description of p as the determinant of some expression that's linear in x, with a symmetric matrix that's linear in x. Okay. That's the determinantal part, and there's one more piece. That there needs to be a point x that you can plug in, a point e you can plug in, so this thing is positive definite. Yep. If the generalized lax conjecture is true, why do you, like, do you have something that is not SOS hyperbolic here? Uh, uh, so this is kind of, um, okay, so the question is, is if, how does, is at some level, how does this relate to the generalized lax conjecture? So in the generalized Lax conjecture, um, I mean, we know, and I'll, we'll see an example later in the talk, of a, we know polynomials that, for which no power has a definite determinant of representation, um, that for which the hyperbolicity cone is spectrohedral. So Mario, for example, has an, exa has an example of one of these. We'll see this example. So they're kind of, these are much stronger requirements than what the generalized Lax conjecture would ask you for. Okay. Okay. The conjecture will give you denominators, sums of squares for certain denominators. Right. Okay, so that's, this is the, the statement, and this kind of, you know, there's a result like this in terms of testing hypervelocity. If you have, uh, if you look at this um, Hermit matrix based test for hypervelocity, that will be a matrix sum of squares. Uh, and also, the sort of the Ronskian version of this is in, is in uh, Mario Daniel and, and Cynthia's paper. So it's really a mild generalization of those statements. It's really the same argument. Okay, so what does this tell us? I mean, based on things we know about uh, polynom hyperbolic polynomials that have, for which powers have definite determinantal representations, it tells us that if you start with a hyperbolic polynomial in three variables for this construction, you'll always produce sums of squares. Okay, by the Helsinki Unicard theorem. Or you can give an, a much simpler direct argument for this. So, also if you take hyperbolic quadratics, these are always SOS hyperbolic. Again, you could use the definite determinantal representation result um, or give a, a, a really quite easy direct argument because non-negative quadratic forms are sums of squares is really the, essentially the result there. And, and a result that I learned um, from Mario Comer and I did not know about, and it's, it's a very nice result. So there's a result, of, um, a result that says that if you look at a hyperbolic cubic in four variables, okay, the, the square of this thing, or that this has a Hermitian definite determinantal representation, or its square has a symmetric determinantal, definite determinantal yeah. representation, this tells us that hyperbolic cubics in four variables are always an SOS hyperbolic. Okay, so what about some other situations? Okay, so it turns out that if you have degree four, degree at least four, uh, and number of variables at least four, there's examples. We have now have examples of um, hyperbolic polynomials that are not SOS hyperbolic. Okay. And okay, in the degree three case, it's not, not quite so satisfying. So I have an example of degree three in 43 variables, okay, that's not SOS hyperbolic. And of course, we would like an example in five variables. Okay, so there's a problem for everyone to work on, if you're interested, okay? And so really, how does this work? You, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you minimal examples, and then there's methods to kind of increase the degree, increase the number of variables, and preserve this property of being not SOS hyperbolic. So what's the quartic example? I'm gonna just briefly mention this one. It's a well-known example. It's this, what we often call the specialized Balmoche polynomial. You get this by taking the basis generating polynomial of the Balmoche matroid and restricting to a four-dimensional subspace. Okay, so it's this concrete quartic. Turns out to be hyperbolic, I mean, stable, so hyperbolic with respect to any point in the non-negative orthant in the positive orthon, but in particular it's hyperbolic with respect to this choice of E. Okay. And if you make you know, this choice of U, for whatever reason, we will get we can you know, show that this particular concrete polynomial that should be non-negative is not a sum of squares. <coughs> I just want to point out that there's a, a really nice construction of non-negative quartics and, and higher degree non uh, sorry, not, hyperbolic quartics and higher degree hyperbolic polynomials due to Armenia and Brandon. 
um, but really this is the, you know, the first case of. Um, <coughs> they really come from taking, taking, say, graphs. For any graph, you can produce some kind of hyperbolic quartic. Um, Sorry, does a set of u for which uh, you know, this polynomial phi is as well as hyperbolic is a convex cone? Uh, is a convex yes. subcone? Yep. <coughs> Hold on, the set of, yes, the set of u for which this is, yep. So this will give you, um, I mean, this is, I think, this, this was the idea, the, the core idea, I think, in, in, the, in the paper of, of, of Cynthia and Daniel and Mario was to go in that direction. It was to say, think about when is this SOS? This gives me something that might be the hyperbolicity cone, or it might be a uh, relaxation, you know, one or the other. We, it's hard to think up here about which way, but an approximation. In some sense. <coughs> well, I'm interested in going the other way and saying, let's imagine I can solve hyperbolic programs reliably and well, which you know, we hopefully can do soon, or we more or less can do. What can we use this for? Okay. But in this case, you, there are, you, you know you for which it is SLS also. Uh, yes, SLS. yeah. What's the phi in this? Can you say a bit more about the phi that you get? Uh, By homogeneous, or what degree? And yeah, okay, so um, let's see. I mean, in x, this will have degree, I mean, it's not even bihomogeneous, uh, as written here. Um, it always has degree 2 in the y's. Right? It always has degree 2 in the y's, and then it has components in x of degree uh, uh, Six, four, two, and the way I've set things up here. Because of the I mean, because of the but it, but if I just looked at a particular combination, I would. Yeah. So it's inhomogeneous in x and homogeneous quadratic in y. Well, one way I can make it sort of ni much more nice and homogeneous is to put y as as then I'll get something nice and homogeneous of degree six, two d minus two. So I want to spend a little bit of time, the last few minutes of the talk, talking about cubics, OK? Because this is where you don't know as much, and they're also nice and interesting. Um, so I want to talk about hyperbolic cubics and, and show you the example I have of a non-SOS hyperbolic cubic. Um, but also say a couple of other things about hyperbolic cubics, OK? So the first thing is, you can't see this, but OK, I mean, it's going to be easier for us to think about the hyperbolicity test for cubics in terms of this um, test based on the discriminant of this depressed cubic, so a fact known for a long time. But if I look at a cubic with no quadratic term and I you know, choose these coefficients to make things look nice, then this is going to have real roots if and only if the very simple inequality holds on the coefficients. Okay. And you can recover this from the fancy multivariate technology, but it's easier to think about this for now. And in particular, this is going to suggest for me to focus on cubics in a very nice form, okay, for the rest of the talk. I'm going to be interested in looking at cubics in, in n plus 1 variables, okay, and the direction of hyperbolicity being just the first coordinate direction of this form where the kind of quadratic coefficient is just the sum of the squares, and then all the interesting action happens in the, in the last coefficient that has no, in the coefficient that doesn't involve x0. Okay. <coughs> focus on cubics of this form, so you can choose whatever cubic form you like in, um, in n variables to plug in here uh, for the rest of the talk. Okay. So the first observation is very simple based on the previous slide, okay. is that if you look at cubics of this form, then they're going to be hyperbolic with respect to the first direction, if and only if, I mean, this inequality holds on the right, which is just saying that the square of your cubic, something of degree 6, is less than or equal to um, the cube of the sum of squares for all x in Rn. Okay, so it tells you directly, or if you want to reinterpret it uh, in a sort of inhomogeneous way, that if you look at the maximum value of this last coefficient, last part of the polynomial over the sphere, this should be at most 1. If it's at most 1, this thing will be hyperbolic with respect to that direction. Otherwise, it won't be. In particular, one thing this tells us is a bit of a side note, but it kind of comes out in the wash. It's, I don't think we knew this before, but it's hard to decide whether a cubic is hyperbolic or not with respect to a direction. Okay, so it's a, it's a well-known fact, I mean, shown by Nesterov, but it really, 
the really heavy lifting of this result goes back much earlier to Moskvin and Strauss in a slightly different context, that if you take a graph, <coughs> you can define a cubic polynomial out of the graph. So what I'm going to have is variables corresponding to the vertices and variables corresponding to the edges. Okay, so number of edges plus number of vertices variables. I'm just going to sum over the edges xi times xj times yij. Okay, this gives me a nice cubic. Okay. Um, and it turns out that the maximum of this cubic over the sphere is some fairly simple expression involving the size of the largest clique in the graph. And so if you kind of slightly rewrite this in this context of hyperbolic polynomials, okay, I can define this family of polynomials okay, with a parameter k, an integer, so that this polynomial is hyperbolic with respect to the first direction if and only if uh, the size of the maximum clique in the graph is less than equal to k. So this suggests that it's not easy to check hyperbolicity uh, in this kind of uh, NP-hardness sense. It's a bit of a, a side note. So let's go back to our question about SOS hyperbolicity. So, it, so we've seen that for, for cubics in this particular form, we're hyperbolic with respect to the first coordinate direction if and only if this sextic is globally non-negative. Okay. And it turns out that if you kind of work through the work through things and, and, and sort of massage the, the definition a little bit, that if P is SOS hyperbolic with respect to the first coordinate direction, then this thing should actually be a sum of squares. Okay, so this is, in fact, the determinant of that, um, that Hankel matrix. And so if, that Hankel ma if this Hankel matrix was matrix sum of squares, which is really what my condition is, then its determinant will be a sum of squares. <coughs> so, this is, so if I want to produce an example of a cubic that's not SOS hyperbolic, one thing, way I could try to do that is to try to construct a cubic Q for which this thing is not a sum of squares. And we sort of, the result in the previous slide suggests we should be able to find these things, okay? And so the question is really how simple can I make such a construction? Um, so I'm gonna use a construction that's in the same flavor. So I'm gonna take a graph, I'm gonna produce a hyperbolic polynomial, um, I've chosen these coefficients so that uh, this thing is um, so the maximum value of, I mean, when I rewrite, when I, okay, I guess if I write this with a 2 and a 9 over 2, so the maximum value over the sphere is exactly uh, 1. So, I mean, I've chosen these coefficients based on the size of the largest clique in this graph. Put it that way. Oh. Is the previous condition also equivalent to somehow theta not being exact, the Lovash theta not being exact? Um, the last theta not being exact, I do not know. It's, I think, more closely related to these, um, this SOS hierarchy for co-positivity, or for, for the, that hierarchy. So that, that's really where this construction comes from. Sorry? That, I think that would be theta plus, right? I'm not sure, but you, you, should, you do know this, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's in your thesis, so. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so I guess uh, this is the simplest example I could come up with. So the graph is this icosahedral graph, so the sort of one skeleton of the icosahedron. It's got 12 vertices, 30 edges. 12 plus 30 plus 1 is 43, and so that's where the 43 comes from. Um, and I say it has 20 maximum cliques, so 20 triangles, because this is kind of one of the reasons why it's difficult for this non-negative polynomial to be a sum of squares. So I haven't gone through this, but the places where you know, this Q on the end here achieves its maximum, uh, achieves the maximum one, <coughs> um, these are in fact places where the corresponding um, hyperbolic certificates of non-negativity all have to vanish. So these polynomials I construct in the, the hyperbolic certificates that come from here, as long as you don't compose well the maps, all must vanish um, on a bunch of points, I mean, sort of signed indicators of where these maximum cliques are. Okay, so I've sort of set things up so this has to have a lot of zeros and it kind of has too many zeros to be a sum of squares. So it's a way to find smaller examples will be const to construct cubics on the sphere that have a lot of, if you like, um, 
they have sort of eigenvectors, if you like, that are these maximum eigenvectors, a lot of them, should be the right way to construct this. Okay. And so one just quick comment is that as a corollary, remember that if I had a, if I had a power of my hyperbolic polynomial had a definite determinant or representation, then I was SOS hyperbolic. So it's a corollary that gives me a cubic um, for which no power has a definite determinant or representation. I don't think we had an example of this before. So that's kind of a nice thing that came out on the wash. As well. Okay, and of course, just to restate the conjecture, you know, I guess the conjecture is that there should be an example with five variables. Um, Where does the 43 come from? The 43 comes from 1 plus 12 plus 30. So just a, one slide of reflection, maybe, and then we'll wrap up. So these hyperbolic certificates are, you know, a little bit, there's one thing that's a bit unsatisfying about them as certificates of non-negativity, and that is that this proof of non-negativity relies on a proof of hypervelocity. And we've seen that, okay, it's not necessarily going to be, you're, you may not have a nice short proof of hypervelocity. Okay, so um, this is certainly different from SOS. If I give you an SOS certificate, you know, there's no other thing you have to prove apart from believing that squares are non-negative. Okay, so um, that's one sort of thing to, to reflect on, I think. The other thing is that we've discussed this already. There's, okay, there's lots of choices in this construction. You know, I, I don't know what good choices are in general. Um, I think one of the good things is there's then possibly a chance to tailor these constructions to a particular problem class. Um, but I think, you know, at the moment there's way too many choices and I don't know where to start. This is a real, I think some of these are, yeah, you, know, you can view these as features or bugs. But I don't know which one they are at this point. So let's wrap up. So what we've seen is um, sort of tractable sufficient conditions for polynomial non-negativity that we can search for by solving hyperbolic optimization problems. And we've studied a bit this question of um, when do I get things that are not SOS hyperbolic and so get a chance of sort of having new certificates of non-negativity that are not obviously captured by sums of squares. Okay. And so we've seen that uh, there's certain situations where all the certificates you get are SOS hyperbolic and then it seems that in larger degrees and larger number of variables at least we can find um, hyperbolic polynomials that will produce for us certificates that are not sums of squares. Okay. We've seen on the way that it's can't be hard to decide hyperbolicity of cubics um, and an explicit example of a cubic, no power of which has a definite determinant or representation. And one thing I think, you know, in the hyperbolic programming workshop, one thing I think we've lacked uh, so far have been sort of ways to produce natural hyperbolic programs to play with, to try to see if, you know, they do or don't work better than other things. And I hope this is a possible step towards kind of having a, a more generic machine to produce hyperbolic programs like the sum of squares machine that produces semi-definite programs that I think has you know, contributed a lot to the, the semi-definite programming um, being applied to lots of different problems. Okay. And just, if you're interested, there's a, a preprint on the archive related to this talk. Wonderful talks. So we'll move right away to the question and discussion session. We're going to do this by boarding groups now. Okay, so we're going to have a slightly different format. We're going to, I'm going to ask you for a question by boarding group. So if you are a PhD student, that means you are here but you do not have a PhD yet, anybody have a question? So I invite the PhD students to ask the question to the speaker. Jonathan, where are you? You must have a question. Um, okay, uh, so you, you were able to generate this polynomial from some graph. Uh, I guess maybe a question could be something like, does that mean that maybe you could think of graphs as certificates for positivity? Is there some more general thing you could say there? I mean, um, I don't know is the shortest answer to that question, but I think Perhaps what's nice about being able to construct these hyperbolic polynomials that have kind of combinatorial structure is that potentially then 
the certificates you get inherit some of this combinatorial structure, like where they should vanish, you know, it somehow relates to this graph. And you know, maybe that, I mean, speculating very wildly, if you are much, much cleverer than I am, you might be able to use this kind of, you might be able to then somehow tailor your hyperbolic polynomial to some combinatorial problem that you're trying to solve. That's wild speculation. Okay. I should have said undergrads are also invited to ask questions. I see one. Okay, anybody else? Graduate students, Jess, Isabel, anybody have a question? Okay, so in the second boarding group would be uh, postdocs. So you are a postdoc if you even so if you do not have a faculty position, right? like you're not tenure track somewhere, you know, and people from Toyota maybe are included. So if you are a postdoc, do you have a question for the speaker? I can call on people. Yes. Well, well sort of. Okay. <laughs> is there any way to search for these? You have these par these polynomials f and g you choose. Is there any hope that you can search for them also via hyperbolic program or something? Have you ever um, I would say probably not. Okay. Thinking about the analogy with sum of squares. So choosing, I mean, choosing the uh, subspace of polynomials you want to take sums of squares from is kind of the game we play when we for example, try to come up with projected spectrohedral descriptions of convex sets, and I think this is you know, still pretty much an art. So I think it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's very much like doing PSD factorization of non-negative matrices. It's, like, that seems to be a much harder problem than kind of once you've fixed your, uh, those, those features, those functions you're using, then sort of, combining them in a nice convex way. Okay, so here we'll encourage other postdocs to ask questions. Katarina, any questions? Everything clear? Okay, last call. I guess the senior, so now general boarding, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So maybe I missed this, but do you have a... a a non-negative polynomial without a, a hyperbolic certificate? Um, and do everyone, do all polynomials have, non-negative polynomials have that? So I guess, if we don't allow this composition with other things, then for example, I mean, any I mean, an example I, I, I wonder about a ternary, a non-negative ternary cortex, I mean, like Motskin. Okay, at least, you know, if I start with a, a three-variable hyperbolic polynomial, I'm not going to be able to capture that. Because any three-variable hyperbolic polynomial will be SOS hyperbolic. But I could potentially use hyperbolic polynomial with many more variables, or with more variables, you know, look at the family of things it produces and then restrict to a subspace. So I mean, so I, I so it's kind of when you allow this more flexibility, it's, it's to me much less clear what uh, you know, is possible. And I have not, I mean, I would then have to show, I, I guess I don't have an explicit one where I know that there isn't a way to choose P and F and G and all this stuff. Um, but even the existence of such an example is not clear, is it? it could no, be I do. Every, for every non-negative thing, there is some hyperbolic. There's some crazy hyperbolic. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. Maybe not, but you know, it's not. Clear. No, it's, I think it's not. So, so, what happens in terms of the number of variables? <coughs> How can you produce things in many variables from somehow your original data with a small number of variables? Your original data being I mean, the your p uh, your choices that you make, right? Mm. right okay, in some kind of non-trivial way. So I'm I'm thinking kind of like the way that you would use cats, right? Right? Or kind of when you have families of inequalities, right? And what you really want somehow is, you know, to extend those inequalities to you know, kind of a larger number of variables. I mean, and part of the problem is that you know, classically you cannot do this in other than combinatorially, but in here. I mean, can you actually search somehow over your... 
interesting. So I don't, I don't know. Uh, I've only really thought about the other direction of starting with a bigger thing than the number of variables you're looking for and then restricting. But yeah. Non-SOS uh, hyperbolic polynomial in less than 43 variables? I do think these exist, yeah. I didn't. Uh, so I, I guess the, the conjecture is that one exists in five variables. And the kind of, there's a bit of, I mean, the reason for this conjecture is that um, the special case of hyperbolic cubics in four variables, um, one reason you, that might not be so crazy that that, it, that happens is because of this special case of um, uh, right, ternary quartics, quartic forms being sums of squares. And this kind of non-negative ternary quartics all being sums of squares. Yeah. At least if you, so for example, if you look at the Bayesian um, and you look at the, the one one entry of the Bayesian, which should be a non-negative polynomial, in that case, uh, once you sort of do things correctly, you will get a, a ternary quartic form that's not negative. And so it's not at all obvious, and I, I don't know how to extend that to give a direct proof in that case. Um, but this is sort of some evidence that there's, you know, somehow something special happens in that case. To me. I, think, I think these are not unrelated, and the dimension counts when you look at things correctly seem to be the same. So that's, that's the kind of reason why we might expect five variables to, yeah, to be in there. Okay, Nikki. Uh, so in your example with Max Cleek, so you yeah. had an example of a graph where uh, SOS, where you can get a hyperbolic upper certificate of an upper bound, but SOS gets a, a worse bound. Mm -hmm. Can you get a sequence of graphs where that bound, where you can quantify the gap, where the gap goes to infinity or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cynthia, then Boris. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you looked at all about, there's all these operations that preserve yeah. hyperbolicity um, that can be used to like certify them. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, have you looked at all if which of these like preserve SOS-ness, SOS, SOS hyperbolicity? Yeah, um, not in great detail. So for example, I mean, multiplying things, if they're both SOS hyperbolic, then the result will be SOS hyperbolic. Because essentially the, these Hankel matrices are added. Um, beyond that situation, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that, so for example, one thing I, I didn't say, but I should say, is that if your SOS is hyperbolic, you know, one implication of that is that your hyperbolicity cone is a projected spectrohedron. And so I think a lot of these operations, we don't know what they do to that, to, to whether you're a projected spectrohedron or not. Your hyperbolicity cone. So the more interesting operations, like derivatives and, and other things. So. <coughs> I have a naive question. So there is a uh, criterion in the univariate case, which would be probably better known, saying that if you have a univariate polynomial with simple roots, this happens if and only if a certain bunch of other polynomials are strictly positive. Uh, and I wonder, is how is this classical criterion related? Yeah, I guess I don't know the, exactly the criterion you're referring to from that description, but yeah, I, I, so yeah, I, I don't think I can very good topic to talk about over the break exactly. Okay, yeah. one very last question. Okay, if not, then we'll thank James again for.